This is Rapture. It's one of the most iconic and memorable video game locations in existence. By putting hours of dedication and care into its characters, level design, and world interaction, Bioshock was able to convey a subconscious narrative to the player that makes the game immersive, replayable, and memorable. Today we're going to be taking a look at what makes Rapture feel like a real place and how Bioshock told a story without using conventional storytelling techniques. Before we start this video, I just want to say that there are minor spoilers. I, I mean, there's not anything too big that I reveal in this video, but if you guys want to play the game, I, you know, you know. The game starts with a cutscene telling you the time period in a first person view on an airplane. Also, you're Jack. Hi, Jack. You look at a picture of your family and the plane crashes in the middle of the ocean. You miraculously survive this crash, and even more miraculously, there's a lighthouse right next to where you landed. A really cool note about this introduction is that you go from a first person view cutscene to playing in a game with a really smooth transition. This was something that was not often seen in video games at the time. This doesn't seem like the biggest deal now, but I point it out because of how Bioshock likes to tell its story later throughout the rest of the game. This is an experience. Most of the game's story is told from exploring the world. There aren't many cutscenes and instead it has triggered events that happen in front of you. This makes the player fully immersed in the game while playing. When there is a cutscene, the game transitions you into the gameplay and smoothly back out of it to never break that feeling of immersion. Immersive being the perfect word to describe the city of Rapture. If you've seen any other Bioshock video on YouTube, you've probably seen this squid swim by. Guess what? This game takes place underwater. This reveal of Rapture is the first time that we see the game we're playing is at the bottom of the ocean. One of the most vital things the developers did while designing the levels was making sure the player knew they were underwater. It's one of Rapture's biggest distinguishing features, and they made sure to make it obvious to the player. An early visual concept of the game shows tubes that resemble the game's Vita... Vita? Is it Vita or Vita? Hey, hey is it Vita or Vita? Vita Chambers. Vita Chambers. Subscribe to Gaming's Brink. Vita Chambers. It shows tubes that resemble Vita Chambers and a messy lab. As cool as this early design is, the developers thought it looked like it was in a spaceship. They decided that at every turn we were going to try to remind the player that they were in fact underwater and that this wasn't a spaceship. The first thing the game does is transport you from the surface down into the ocean so the player can get a strong grip of their environment and the character's role in the world. Since he's basically a blank slate that has no prior knowledge of Rapture, this lets the player put themselves in Jack's shoes with the mindset of, I've never been here before, let's explore the world. I bring this up because this subconsciously shifts the player's focus from figuring out how the character fits into the world and instead to pay attention to their surroundings. Since the character has never been there, there will be no relationship between the character and the place. This setup for a story is very common in order for a viewer, reader, or player to learn about the world while their character is learning as well. Being comfortable with this setup without questioning it is how Bioshock was able to pull off one of the greatest plot twists in video game history. But that is for a different video. Before seeing the underwater city, you see a film explaining who Andrew Ryan is. He created the city because he wanted to create a society that rewards you for hard work. The simplest way I'll explain it in this video is he doesn't like when governments do things like tax you for working. What is the difference between a man and a parasite? A man builds, a parasite asks, where is my share? Once you've sat through the spectacle that is rapture, your bathysphere finally lands. What wonders await you in this underwater city? Will there be amusement parks? Are the people cool here? Do they have forests to create air for the city? How do people in the city get food? What wonderful, unthinkable surprises does this city have to offer? Holy shingles. Before you even step out of the bathysphere, the game sets the tone for how the rest of this adventure is going to go. When playing this game for the first time, I knew nothing about it. I was not aware of the dystopian setting and that monsters were going to be here. This cutscene and the gameplay that followed it gave a great example of what to expect throughout the rest of the game. What the heck happened here, you may be thinking as you walk through the rubble, knocked over trash cans, and the flaming couch. Everything is destroyed and the city is falling apart. 
Atlas calls in a turret showing that there are people in this world that are prepared for this sort of thing, proving that people behaving in this way is normal here. Well, that door doesn't open, might as well inject ourselves with this mystery goop. I guess lightning comes out of our hands now. So while writhing in pain on the floor, the big daddy and little sister walk by to introduce themselves for the first time. You walk by them a few times and see them walking around together as you slowly piece together their purpose in the city. I'm going to take this moment to talk about enemies in the game for a second. First off, you have the splicers, which are just people who have turned crazy. Then we've got the turrets, cameras, and flying bots. Then, most eye-catching are the big daddies in their metal suits, always accompanied by a little sister with glowing yellow eyes. Before fighting them, you see them walking around here, and during this cutscene, and this little thing happens, and then one dies, and not to mention these guys are on the freaking box. Basically, you know they're a big deal. The little sisters harvest Adam from dead bodies. Adam being the stuff that made all of these people crazy. Their biggest selling point being that they pretty much gave you superpowers. You can shoot all sorts of things out of your hands. Lightning, fire, cyclones, b b bees. Sure. In the beginning of the game, this is pretty much all you know about the world. There's Adam, and the highly addictive properties of it are causing people to do crazy things after altering their genetic code. A design choice I really appreciate is they kept the enemies as human as possible. This allows for the player to connect with the enemies in a way where they can show feelings of sympathy. These aren't monsters or zombies, they're literally just humans that have a screw loose. If you look in the game's museum, you can see some of the other enemies they were originally planning to put into the game. Just looking at these felt like they were from a completely different game and made me think immediately of Left 4 Dead. Would we be able to show that same level of sympathy or relatability when they've turned into these monstrosities? Probably not, and this is the reason these enemies were taken out of the game. And then, you know, Bioshock 2 comes along and- Going back to the big daddies now! Up to this point, you've seen them a few times, and you know that you're gonna have to fight one eventually. These mini-boss fights give you the opportunity to collect Adam from the little sisters, giving you the option to buy more plasmids. You know, the stuff that you inject into your cells to get superpowers. Once you get rid of the big daddy that is protecting the little sister, you have the option to either harvest her or save her. If you harvest her, you kill her, but get more Adam. But if you save her, you get a good conscience. And if you've ever harvested a little sister, I'm sorry, we can't be friends. This option, weighing your morales against the player's economic security, completely changes the way you look at this world. This is the closest thing you've seen to a monster in the game, and that makes the possibility of turning her back to the way she was a complete game changer. For one, you realize that you can make a difference in this world. With this one little task, you realize you have a little bit of power to save at least one thing in this hellhole. This loops back to what we were talking about earlier with the splicers. If you weren't thinking of them as human up to this point, now will be the part where you realize that these used to be normal people. If you can save something this demented to this extreme, the splicers may have hope. As you explore Rapture, you find audio logs scattered around the place. It's really interesting because since the city is transformed into its dystopian state, the logs are used as a way to give the player an idea of what the world was like before the fall of Rapture, and what events caused it to get to this point. There is a lot learned through the audio logs, and I mean a lot. There is over an hour of tapes to listen to, but they play in the background as you explore through the level, so as long as someone doesn't interrupt it on the radio, you'll be okay. Although, this happens way more than I'd like, so I tend to just stand still while listening to them. Like we said earlier, Andrew Ryan built this city because of his objectivist political views. He brought the greatest minds from around the world to help him build his underwater city. This city is underwater, by the way. He did this to get away from the rest of the world. To give an example of his views, there's an audio log that explains that Ryan used to own a forest that the government wanted to turn into a public park. Ryan thinking, I earned and bought this land, it belongs to me, decided to burn the forest down in spite. In order to stay outside the reaches of the government, he had to keep his city a secret. The foundation of the city systems are based on Ryan's ideology of, you can work and express yourself freely without the limitations of government control. This means artists can work in any way they choose. Scientists can conduct research without people stepping in and stopping it for any reason. People can create and sell any product they want. This was Ryan's utopia, and he worked his assumption off to make it. There are statues, banners, and audio logs that make these things apparent. When making the game, the developers paid special attention to the city and decided to craft a story around it that made sense. First came the city, and then they needed to create a character that would decide to make a city underwater. 
It's obvious that a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into doing this because the city feels real, and the characters that make up the city feel like they have legitimate reasons for being there. Throughout all of the audio logs, you hear about Andrew Ryan and Frank Fontaine because they are all the gossip, guys. Basically, a scientist discovered Adam by playing with a sea slug, and then Frank Fontaine started selling plasmids and Eve hypos. Eve hypos are ways to replenish the Adam in your body. We're going to be taking a look at the level Medical Pavilion to get an understanding of how this game teaches you the effects of Adam on this society. The purpose of this level is to retrieve a key from a plastic surgeon named Dr. Steinman, and it takes place immediately after a scene where you see a big daddy kill a splicer for the first time. At this point in the game, all the player knows about Adam is that the little sisters collect it. While exploring the medical pavilion, you pick up audio logs by Dr. Steinman explaining that the implementation of Adam and his work has completely changed the limitations of surgery. As you progress through the level, the audio logs start to change in tone, and you start to notice the decline in Steinman's mental state. He claims to start seeing the goddess of beauty, Aphrodite, and she's telling him to do something about symmetry. Right next to where you find this log, you see this abomination of a patient. That seems to have a bunch of different faces stitched onto her. When you finally reach Steinman, he's in his workstation trying to operate. If you were to have completely ignored the audio logs up to this point, you would still get the message that this is probably one of the guys Batman is trying to stop from escaping. However, you wouldn't have seen the transition from a highly respected doctor to the monster that now inhabits Steinman's body. The audio logs in this level showcases exactly what Adam can do to a person. This is the product that Frank Fontaine is selling, and Andrew Ryan allows it to happen because he believes in free market. I know this video is getting long, so I'm not going to break down every single little thing. I'm going to go and give you a quick overview of what we learned from the audio logs throughout the next few levels. Andrew Ryan creates the city and Frank Fontaine creates a huge company within the city that sells pretty much everything. They discover Adam and Fontaine has scientists Tenenbaum and Suchong do research on it while they start selling it. Tenenbaum starts work on the acquisition of Adam while Suchong starts experimenting with what can be done with it. Tenenbaum creates little sisters and Suchong creates plasmids. Fontaine sells plasmids and gets people addicted to it. Turns out, people aren't just addicted to it, they begin to become dependent on it and without taking it, they will start sustaining cosmetic and mental Damage. It turns out somebody's smuggling things into the city, and that's not good because Ryan wants to keep the city a secret. He suspects Fontaine is the one doing it and starts hanging all of the people he knows are tied to the smuggling operation. People are upset about the hangings and start expressing their distaste for Andrew Ryan, effectively starting a civil war between Ryan and Fontaine. Meanwhile, Fontaine does things like opening up a home for the poor so nearly everybody in the city starts to side with him. There are a lot of illegal things Fontaine is doing, like killing people who don't work with him, but there's no solid evidence that ties him to it. Of it. People are put in a position where they are scared of Fontaine and not happy with Ryan. Ryan kills Frank Fontaine, and yeah, that's pretty well, yep, that's all I'm gonna say for now. I'm sorry if that little section of the video was boring. This is a video analyzing how Bioshock is able to tell a story, so this is the last time I'm going to do a story recap, I promise. However, I use this to help me bring up a point that I want to stress about storytelling in video games because Bioshock takes advantage of it in a way I don't see many other video games do. You have the opportunity to explore the world and discover these things inside a video game. You have the option to pass over things or look deeply into everything to discover the secrets that hide underneath every stone. The sort of information that when put into a book or movie would be considered exposition. A little bit of it is okay, but having too much at once makes things really boring. There is a lot of stuff this game tells you, and having this information in a world is so much easier to convey in a video game than in a book or movie. When designing Rapture, they made sure to take advantage of the player's freedom to see and explore as much as they possibly could. They didn't just make levels, they made an underwater city, and the player is a tourist, taking in everything they possibly could. I mean, wouldn't you if you went to an underwater city? A picture tells a thousand words, but an interactable world can write an entire series. I just gave you an overview of what Bioshock was able to tell us through audio logs, posters, and environment over the span of multiple levels, but... There is a lot more I didn't go into where the game built upon each character, and how significant every individual location was to the story. To wrap up this video and expand upon some of these ideas I just mentioned, I'm going to talk about a level called Fort Frolic. I choose this level because this area kinda takes a break from the drama between Ryan and Fontaine for a moment to take a look at some of the citizens who inhabit Rapture. 
This gives me a little bubble to not have to talk about the Civil War for a moment to explain some of the ways Bioshock told a story outside of just using the audio logs. I just want to point out that all of these mechanics are used throughout the entire game and not just in this level. I just wanted an excuse to talk about Fort Frolic, and if you've played this game, you understand why. And if you haven't played this game, you're about to find out why. An entire video could be made about this level. In fact, Game Maker's Toolkit did that, and it's a really good video if you want to check it out. This level is just supposed to be a stopping point so you can walk from one bathysphere to the other. But before you get to the bathysphere, you know, this happens. If this is your first time ever seeing this level, you're really in for a treat. This whole area is run by a man named Sander Cohen. He was the director of a lot of shows and entertainment, presented through plays and music. You can figure this out by watching him do it in front of your eyes. Yeah, this scene right here really shows you the kind of person he is. But if you want more proof, you can look at the posters on the walls that are advertising different shows, all of them with his name on it. With the things he asks you to do, you slowly start to piece together that this guy is a complete lunatic, and my gosh, he kind of creeps me out. What's really special about this level is that this is the first time in the entire game where Atlas and Ryan are unable to talk to you on the radio. This is also the first time in the game where you aren't given a guide arrow to tell you where to go. Since nobody is asking if you would kindly do anything, you are free for the first time in the game to play a level in any order you want. It's a nice little touch that you wouldn't notice the significance of on your first playthrough. No longer having a guide arrow to point you in the right direction would normally be a problem, however this game gives you multiple objectives, so you're encouraged to explore the area. Pretty much no matter what direction you go in, you're going to be progressing. On top of this, you're put into a mall, a setting that all players would be familiar with, so they understand the general layout and can easily find their way around the place. Throughout the game, you see dead bodies all over the place. Yay, this is a dystopia, but that's not all they're telling us. Nearly every single dead body in the game tells you some kind of story, if you decide to look hard enough. There are many bodies that are positioned to show that they had killed themselves or tie into other story arcs that you maybe didn't notice the first time through. It's especially noticeable in Fort Frolic because here, every dead body is now a wax statue, and that is abnormal, causing the player to pay special attention to it. A few bodies throughout the game even have audio logs that make you realize that you know who the dead body is. This is kind of a side note, but I also think they did a really good job of tying the story arcs with the game mechanics and level design. Having sections where you use your plasmids to progress or open doors that were locked was a really cool way the game was able to tie all these elements together. Now I'm not gonna lie, I don't think I'm very good when it comes to talking about characters, and that's why I wanted to use Sander Cohen as an example for this segment. Throughout the whole game, it seems like everybody is just trying to kill you, but Cohen instead asks for help because he sees potential in you or something. So you help the guy, and when all is said and done, he doesn't try to kill you. He is the only character in the entire game that gives you the option to walk away. You can kill him so you can find out what's in the box, but that's entirely your choice. Once again, you don't realize how significant it is to have a choice here, until you've played the game once before. To build his character and his relationship to the city, you can listen to the audio logs and put together what kind of man he was as the city was falling apart. He displays his passion for art and the remnants of that still exist even when he's being spliced up. There are a whole bunch of story points that can be missed throughout Bioshock. However, if you rush through the game and just pay attention to what is being laid out in front of you, there's still a lot of stuff you're gonna pick up. So many things about this game will stick in your mind for years to come because of other ways the game was able to convey the story. There weren't many cutscenes and the game didn't force exposition on you. Just by looking at the world, the player was able to put together the pieces of information necessary to understand what was happening in the present moment. For those who enjoy playing games like this, they didn't miss out on anything. For those who wanted to know what happened before the city was destroyed, it was laid out all over the world for them to put together on their own. When I first played the game, I didn't listen to the audio logs or pay much attention to the story, and it still stuck with me. There were many times I would bring the game up and talk about it because it was an extremely memorable experience. I replayed it six years later as a completely different type of gamer and decided I wanted to seek out the story. I was able to enjoy the game in a completely different way, and now I understand how much of a masterpiece this game is. I really hope I was able to show you why I see this game as a masterpiece, and convince you to play or replay the game for yourself. I purposely decided not to talk about a lot of other things that happened in the game because I didn't want to completely ruin the game for anyone. Trust me, 
this was barely scratching the surface of what this game has to offer. Hey guys, thank you for watching my video. I worked really hard on it, so if you liked it, please leave a like and possibly subscribe for more content like this. If you guys want me to make a Bioshock 2 and Infinite video, I, I want to do that. So if you guys want me to do that, tell me to do that, and I'll do that. Um, if you guys if you guys want to see me play these games, I do it live on Twitch. I analyze them right there, live, right in front of you and everything, so that'd be really cool if you guys hopped in. I also have a Discord, you know, in there. In there, you can talk to me and, and tell me to do things. Yeah. Alright, that's the end of the video. Thanks for watching. You guys are awesome.